Well, church growth and church development is a field of study that has produced a lot of theories, a lot of books, seminars on the subject. And no wonder when, 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 with less people attending services and a much more secular society, churches are actually in decline as far as attendance is concerned. And all churches are searching for ways to not only win new converts, but also to maintain, motivate their existing members. Now, much of what has been written comes from ministers of large congregations. If, if any of you have ever read books on church growth, it's usually preachers who preach for these huge mega churches that come out with you know, seminars, books, tapes, all that kind of stuff. And what they do is they package their various growth formulas into books and seminars for the purpose of helping other churches reproduce in their own congregation what's working in these mega churches. Now the problem with this is that, now I'm just going to check to make sure, okay, so that works. Now the problem with this is that research has shown that trying to reproduce a growth model simply by copying another church's system or another church's approaches rarely works. This is why there's only one, for example, Saddleback Church. How many? 25,000 members? There's only one of those. Or there's only one uh, Willow Creek Church. Or there's only one in, in our brotherhood, Memorial Road Church, where I come from in Oklahoma City. The Memorial Road Church, you know, they have, what, 3,000 uh, in attendance? And other churches, I remember in, uh, in Tennessee, the Madison Church for a time, no longer now, but back in the day, back in the 80s and the 90s, Madison Church had 6,000 6, members. It was huge. They had to have the local police force or police cars there on Sunday mornings. Direct, if some of you have ever been there, they had to direct traffic. There were so many people there. 6,000 people. But how many Madison Churches of Christ did we have? Well, there was just the Madison Church. And they did that too. They would try to export their methods, you know, to a 150 member church somewhere in Arkansas, and it didn't work. They are unique to their time and place, and usually they can't be multiplied simply by copying their system. This is not to say that there are not some valuable resources available to help churches grow. One such book is the result of an exhaustive research project about church growth around the world. Researcher called or named uh, Christian Schwartz, he's a church uh, growth researcher, conducted the most exhaustive survey of churches around the world. He surveyed a thousand different churches of every type and size in 32 countries with over 4 million Responses. Now, anybody who's done any research work, if you have four million responses, that's a huge pool to look at in order to find uh, strategies, in order to find uh, infor information. He wanted to know what characteristics do growing churches share? Anybody here remember the book by Stephen Covey a few years back, Seven Habits of... Highly successful people. Remember that? This author, Stephen Covey, uh, poured over 200 years of success type literature in the form of biographies and systems and profiles of successful people from every walk of life. And Mr. Covey eventually distilled this information down to seven key character traits that all successful people share, regardless of their time, regardless of the place they live, regardless of the culture that they lived in, there were seven key features of their character that all successful people had, according to his research. And his findings confirmed the important idea that success is not about how much you acquire or succeed, but rather what kind of person you are. In other words, character over quantity, principles over production. Well, in the same way, I mentioned Stephen Covey, in the same way, Christian Schwartz has done a similar thing with the subject of church growth. His research has revealed that growing churches, 
all growing churches, regardless of country or position or doctrinal issues. He didn't just study churches of Christ around the world. He studied every kind of church, including the churches of Christ, around the world. And it didn't matter if they were big or small, what position they had, whatever they were conservative or non-conservative, whatever it was. He found that all churches that grow share eight specific quality characteristics and they possess these at a level far above non-growing churches. Now the results were very specific about these two points. Not only did growing churches possess these eight quality characteristics, they had them or experienced them at a rate or level that was far above those churches who merely had some or all of the characteristics, but their level and practice of them was at a much lower level. And that's the subject of my class tonight. I want to share these characteristics with you. But before I do, I need to explain the difference between models for church growth and principles for church growth. There's a difference. Models. A model is an existing congregation that, for whatever reason, has experienced success and church growth. The systems used in the model are copied in order to apply them to other churches, hoping to make them grow. That's what's going on in the, what I, in the denominational world, for example. You, know, you have this huge church. They package some sort of church growth seminar, videos, books, so on and so forth, and they sell these things. Or the guy goes out on the road and he, you know, he's trying to take the system that existed in his church, the model if you wish, and he's trying to bring it to some other church group. And, and it doesn't matter which church group, he's just bringing it to another church group in order to superimpose that model on another church and try to get the same results. That's model, the model system. Now, a principle is something that applies to every church at all times. Applies to every church in the world at all times in the world. 17th century, 9th century, 21st century, Africa, United States, South America. The principles always apply. They're generic. They're biblical. They're universal. You see the difference between model and principle. Church models are usually seen in a few very successful and innovative churches that have high profile and export their models for others to copy. Church principles are seen in many, many churches of all sizes and shapes and promote a more natural approach to church growth. So what's my point? My point is that instead of copying a successful model, we should implement principles or characteristics that all growing churches have and share in the, the natural growth that they have. Because I'm all about natural, holistic church growth, not forced church growth. And I believe the Bible teaches us that approach to church growth. And hopefully we'll have time to cover all those ideas between now and, and Saturday. Okay, one last explanation before I share the list with you. The researchers discovered another thing, and that was that growing churches not only shared eight similar characteristics, and it, they, ex, they also experienced them at a very high level. They also learned that each characteristic had a particular quality. Let me explain to you. A person is not, like an athlete, is not just a skater. She's a figure skater. You see what I'm saying? There's a quality to the skill. A man is not just uh, intelligent. He's intelligent in math or he's a genius in physics. See what I'm saying? There's a quality to the characteristic. And so in the research, they found that each characteristic that they found had a specific quality to it that contributed directly to the growth of the church. And I'll explain to you how that works. So here they are, the eight quality characteristics shared by all growing churches. Quality, quality characteristic number one, 
all growing churches had empowering leadership. Empowering leadership. Do you see the breakdown? Not just leadership. All churches have this in one way or another. I've worked at all kinds of uh, churches. Eric was kind of giving me, giving me some of my background. I've been preaching uh, 33 years. And I've worked at all kinds of congregations. Uh, mission churches that, you know, my wife and I began in our living room. You know, six people in the living room, 22 people in the house. We'll meet at somebody in the back of somebody's church building, 30, 40, uh, 50, 70, and then eventually taking that group and moving them into their own building, 80, 90, 100, you know, like you're doing in the church that you've planted. Well, we've had that experience too. I've preached for churches that have 1,000 or 2,000 people, 500 people, Canada, the United States, uh, the Caribbean, uh, French, English, Chinese. All these churches had leadership. But the characteristic that the researchers found that promoted church growth was they had empowering leadership. See the quality? Leaders of growing churches concentrate on empowering other Christians for ministry. Empowering leaders don't just enlist members to help them achieve their personal ministry goal or visions. Empowering leaders assist members in developing their giftedness. Empowering leaders mentor others in reaching their spiritual goals. For example, a leader in the church visits members, we hope. But empowering leaders bring a member with them to visit other members and train them in personal work. See the difference? Another example, leaders teach, leaders evangelize, share their faith. But empowering leaders are always on the lookout to find and disciple members who have these gifts and they provide opportunities for them to use them. Empowering leadership. Empowering leaders invest most of their time in discipleship, delegation, and multiplication rather than accounting, maintenance, putting out fires. Research shows that empowering leaders are not the superstars of megachurches, but rather people who know how to cultivate spiritual qualities in other people. A couple of other interesting findings based on the research in the area of leadership were the following. This was, well, this one, you know, you ever get this thing sometimes where you know something, you just know it. You know it because you know it. You know it because you've seen it. And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, on TV or in a book or in the newspaper, they say a two million research project has just found that people prefer butter over margarine. Duh, you know. Well, this was, this was it for me. This, this thing that they found about leadership, this was an interesting one. Researchers found that formal theological training had a negative effect on church growth. A negative effect. Remember now, be careful what I'm, I'm saying here. Theological training, not biblical training. They're not always the same thing. They're not always the same thing. In other words, the more theological training of the leaders, the less growth. There are a lot of reasons for that. One of them is, well, the, the higher you go up, you know, in theological training, you go to liberal universities. In liberal universities, you, you go to Harvard, they don't even believe in God anymore. <laughs> so it's very hard to motivate a church when you yourself are not believing that the Bible is God's word or that Christ is the Son of God or that you need to be baptized for the remission of sins, when you, when you, you know, d disengage yourself from, from, from these basic teachings thinking that your theology is much higher than what you've read in the Bible, then the result of that is the weakening of the faith of the congregation. Another thing they found out there was a positive relationship between the willingness of leaders to accept help from outside the congregation and the positive growth of the church. 
In other words, leaders who recognized that they needed help to do their jobs usually succeeded better in building growing churches than those who thought they knew it all. I am always encouraging and suggesting and bringing books to my elders. I forget the stat, but it says, you know, most men after 45 stop reading books. They trade reading books for watching TV. And that's fine if that's what you want to do, but if you're a leader in the church, if you're an elder in the church, a preacher in the church, you're always reading books. You're always educating yourself. You're always seeking to understand more, to deepen your understanding, not only of God's word, but of how to apply it. This simply proves that humility is a key ingredient for successful, empowering leadership. Number two, quality characteristic number two, growing churches focused on gift-oriented ministry. Do you see the relationship? Not just people serving in ministry, but people serving in their area of giftedness or strength. When people serve according to their giftedness, they are more likely to be serving in the power of the Lord and not according to their own strength. For professional ministers, identifying and training members in the use of their gifts should be a major pact and a major part, rather, of their actual work. Much of my time... Uh, in the congregation at Choctaw is I'm scouting. I'm always scouting for someone who has some sort of gift. Teaching, perhaps the person's good leading prayer. You know, there was one fella, I, I asked him to lead prayer once. Uh, James, his name was. And, um, and uh, uh, he says, you know, he says, I really don't do that type of thing. Please don't ask me to do that. And I said, hey, okay, I just want to make sure that, you know, you feel included, that, you know, we want you to be part of it. No, you know, teaching a class, getting in front of people, that's, that's not my thing. So a couple of months went by, and, uh, <clears throat> and I noticed Jane was wandering around the hallways. You know, during Bible class, you know, just before they started, just after, between, you know, he's in the hallways around the perimeter of the building. We have a very large building there. And, and I asked one of the elders, what's James doing that? He says, well, he's taking care of kind of security because we had someone, a stranger, just walk right into one of our, you have many doors here, I noticed. We have lots of doors too. And some man that we didn't know came in and was wandering around the area where there are small children. And, you know, there's all kinds of crazy things going on, as we know, today. And so the elders asked James to kind of, you know, patrol. And so his ministry began just by keeping an eye on that. Now he's developing a security plan for evacuation in case there's a fire. We have tornadoes. Sometimes they come upon us real suddenly. He's also developing an evacuation plan if there's a tornado. He's also developing um, and training other brothers in the congregation uh, just in case there's some sort of crazy thing that happens like at the theater in Colorado. It's happened in Oklahoma. Some guy walked in mad at his ex-wife or something, waving a gun around, you know. So I didn't know. He was trained in this type of thing, public safety. So that's his ministry. He's, he's, He's in charge of the security of our congregation when we, when we meet together. He won't lead a prayer in front of the people. But I think he'd take a bullet for the people. <laughs> so he's, you know, he's found his area where he, can, where he can serve. Helping Christians identify and use their gifts contributes to church growth more than any other activity. More than meetings. Quality characteristic number three, growing churches experienced passionate spirituality. By passionate spirituality, I'm not talking about speaking in tongues or rock and roll worship services. That's not what I'm talking about. 
So many churches, you know, things get a little dull, people starting to, you know, get a little antsy, and somebody, some bright voice all of a sudden says, you know what we ought to do? We ought to start clapping, or we ought to stop jumping around, or we ought to, you know, get a team up front, you know. The research showed that growing churches had members who cared deeply about spiritual things. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about passionate spirituality. They cared about Christ and they cared about their lives in Christ. Their passion was in pleasing and serving the Lord. Churches whose focus was only getting the forms right. You understand what I'm saying about only getting the form right? In other words, let's do the things correctly. Let's get the rituals correctly. These were not the churches who grew. And these were not the churches that had enthusiasm. And I have to say, that's one of the problems we have in our brotherhood. We're so focused on the forms. Churches where the focus was on getting their lives right. Churches where the focus was being in sync with Jesus Christ and his word. Those churches found that their enthusiasm for all things, including the forms, promoted growth. Brothers and sisters, nobody, nobody out there, you know, when I say out there, I'm talking about people who are unchurched, don't know anything about the Bible. People out there, do you think they really care? Be careful what I'm saying. I've got this on video so I can always go back. Do you think people out there really care if we use an instrument or not? Some little gal out there who's got three kids by two different guys and the last guy dumped her and she's all by herself and she's got food stamps and she's needing help and her life is a mess and somebody invites her to church. Do you really think that she cares that we don't use an instrument? Do you think she really cares that we serve communion every single Sunday. She doesn't care about that. Did I say those things are not biblical? No. Did I say those things are not important? Of course not. Of course they're important. The way we worship is important, that we should do so biblically. What I'm saying is, do you think that that little gal out there with her three raggedy kids, do you think she cares about those things? No. She cares about her life is a mess. That's what she cares about. So if she comes to a church and the only thing she sees and hears is that we put a focus and we put the priority on how we do things, then she's going to walk away saying, those people care more about their, than they care about me. Period. What I'm saying is, it's just where we put the emphasis. All right, quality characteristic number four. All growing churches had functional structures. Functional structures. Every church has some kind of structure or organization, but not all structures promote growth. You guys who are in business, you ladies who are in business, you know what I'm talking about. Every, every business has some sort of organizational set if you wish but not all organizations are as functional same thing happens in the church functional structures are those that promote church life effective ministry clear communication now what's interesting about this research is that it confirms statistically what I've been teaching about church organizations for 20 years and that is if we don't use the New Testament structure for organization we can't grow the way the New Testament wants us to grow so here are a couple of principles the most effective structure for the church is the one that is outlined for the church in Acts chapter 2 did you know that in Acts chapter you know we we talk about Pattern, pattern theology, you know, there's a pattern in the Bible. We want to know how, how should we baptize? Well, we go to the Bible and there's a pattern. There, it teaches us. We have a blueprint that teaches us how to do that thing. We use water. It's by immersion in the name of Jesus, so on and so forth. 
Well, how do we do communion? You know, well, we do it once on Sundays, and or we do it every Sunday, and we take both the bread and the, and the fruit of the vine. You know, the, the Bible has a, it, it has a pattern for these things. Well, the Bible also has a pattern for how we're organized. And the pattern for church organization is in Acts chapter 2. I don't have time tonight to read the whole thing, but I think we're pretty familiar here with Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, there are five major areas of ministry. Oh, there they are. Good. Five. There are only five. There are not six, there are not three, there are not nine, there are only five. I've, I've done this at a seminar, I challenge anybody to give me any activity in the church, and I will put it in one of those five areas of ministry. First area of ministry, evangelism. In Acts chapter 2, what does Peter do? He gets up, what's he do? He preaches the gospel to the lost, and what, that, what do they do then? They baptize those who respond in repentance and, and, uh, and baptism, or faith and repentance, and they baptize those people. That's the ministry of evangelism. How do you do the ministry of evangelism? Well, you, you tell lost people about the, 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 the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that they need to be saved. You teach them how to respond and then you baptize them when they do respond. That's evangelism. 50 million ways of doing it, but basically that's the ministry. Our problem, of course, is we're evangelizing the saved rather than evangelizing the lost. Therefore, we don't grow. Number two area of ministry is education. Acts 2.42a. And they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Well, that's the ministry of education. Teaching the saved the words of Christ. Teaching the saved to obey the commands of Christ. Mark 16. Uh, evangelism, education, fellowship. Uh, Matthew 28. Rather. Fellowship. And they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to fellowship... What is fellowship? Eating pizza together? No. Fellowship is integrating every single member more tightly into the body of Christ. That's fellowship. Teaching each member the basics of what we share in Christ. Ephesians 4, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one spirit, one body. Fourth ministry, worship, and they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. Worship is a ministry, the adoration of God. What are you doing on Sunday? I'm going to gather with other Christians in order to adore God, to praise Christ, to take the communion. That's a ministry. All that goes into that. And then, of course, the fifth ministry is the ministry of service. They were ministering to one another and those in the community. And you read all the way down to Acts chapter 2, verse 46. What's interesting is, in Acts 2, 47, Luke finishes off that passage by saying, and the Lord was adding, what is it? Anybody remember the passage? Amen. And the Lord was adding daily who? Those who were being saved. Well, here's how it works. I don't have a slide for it. Here's the equation. If you're able to get those five ministries up and running simultaneously, the Lord adds to the church. The Lord add, You don't add to the church. We don't add to the church. We minister. We find out where we can minister best. We find out which ministry needs help. We find out who's got the best talents for which ministry. Ministers teach others how to minister. Elders oversee. They guard the flock, so on and so forth. You know, we're ministering. And the better we minister, and the more that these five ministries are, are working simultaneously, the faster the Lord adds to the church. And when these ministries drop out, sometimes... Sometimes you've got a church that has only two ministries going. Worship and fellowship. That's all they do. They don't evangelize. They don't, you know, that's all they do. They don't serve outside their building. They're bumping along, you know, for year after year. It's fine. And so they say, how do we grow? And what is it that we need to do? So you go in and you find out what they're not doing. Which one of the five ministries are you not doing? And if you're doing it, are you doing it biblically? And you reconstruct each one of those five ministries. You get them working simultaneously. Don't even worry about that. Last thing we ever do at Choctaw is put a, uh, you know, this year we're going to try to have 100 baptisms. No. 
This year we're going to try to be more effective in this ministry or that ministry. Or we're going to hire people that will train us in this ministry or that ministry. Because if we take care of this side, the Lord will take care of that side. The research demonstrated that the closer to this organizational model the church was, the greater the growth, the further away we were from this organizational model, the worse growth that we had. All right, now we get to quality characteristic number five, inspiring worship services. Again, we need to take a difference between style and inspiring worship. There are a lot of styles of worship services. <clears throat> There's high church style, a lot of ceremony, you know, Catholic church, Lutheran church, Church of England. That's high church. There's high impact worship with music, performers, lights. Our Pentecostal friends have cornered that market. High impact. Seeker services geared to introduce worship to non-believers. Where you look at the service and you're trying to figure out if it, is, if it even is a worship service. But they call it a seeker service. Church, did you have that church.tv here? In Oklahoma, one of the things that is happening is a lot of these evangelical churches are taking over shopping centers. So let's say a Sears, you know, Sears in a shopping center shuts down. They'll take over that whole store and they'll convert it into a church. Church.tv. And what they do is they have a lot of uh, audiovisual gear and they connect several of these places together with on TV so you've got one quote pastor quote pastor preacher evangelists and he preaches on Sunday and this this signal is fed to all of these kind of other churches and they have seeker services all kinds of things uh, uh, for um, for people who have never been churched it's the latest fad in, in church growth but what the research shows was that the style did not impact growth one way or another. Changing your style of worship will not necessarily produce growth. There's a church in Oklahoma City. They decided, you know, it would be a good idea if we had instruments and music. We're not growing. And, you know, there were a lot of young people. And a lot of these young people, college students, they were going to other churches where they had instruments, blah, blah, blah. And finally, it's too long a story, but even the elders caved in, unfortunately. And they decided, you know what we're going to do? We're going to offer, you know, uh, original and extra crispy. You know, we're the original service, and we're going to offer this, uh, this other service here with a praise team and a band up front and all kinds of doodads going on, because this is going to make us grow. They lost 300 members. This was a church of 1,200 people. They immediately lost 300 members, and they kept declining and declining and declining. And then they gained back a few hundred. Another church didn't go that far, but, you know, changed things around, moved all things around, changed their style, so on and so forth. They lost, well, they were a church of about two or three hundred. They lost 75 people, they gained 75 people. Net zero. Simply two anecdotes I give you to demonstrate that changing the style does not promote growth in the end. Inspiring worship is that worship where the Holy Spirit of God is truly at work in the worshipers and they are inspired by His presence within them. Do we teach that the Spirit comes within us when we're baptized? Isn't that what we teach? Why is it that we don't teach anything else other than that? I mean, if you had something negative happen to you, you know, you got some sort of viral thing that, that went inside of you, wouldn't you want to know what that viral thing is doing inside of you? Why is it that we teach you, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? And then we stop right there. There's never anything else taught to the person about what that Spirit's going to do inside of you. The Spirit of God. Now, I don't know exactly how he's inside of me. God hasn't asked me to understand the metaphysical idea of how the Spirit of God dwells in a human body. I don't know. But the Bible does give us a lot of information about what the Spirit does within us once he's there. Why aren't we teaching that? Why aren't we getting a little excited about that? Now, you cannot manipulate the Spirit of God with your, quote, style of worship. That's magic. That's the definition of the occult. The Holy Spirit inspires or draws worshipers to God 
on the Lord's Day when the worshipers draw closer to God through the Spirit throughout the week. The only factor that style in worship plays is if the worshipers are offering their worship in an acceptable, meaning a biblical manner, and with an acceptable and believing heart. The inspiration for worship, however, does not come from externals like the type of building or talent of the worship leaders, but rather is a dynamic played out between the worshiper and God throughout the week and then shared with others on the Lord's Day when we gather together. I love to see the excitement of VBS. Why? Because these children are sharing a spiritual excitement about things that they're going to learn and do in connection with their faith. You know, the spin-off benefit of this inspired worship experience is the overall growth of members who worship because of inspiration and not because of duty. What kind of heaven are we going to if our worship is based on duty? I don't want to go to that heaven. I didn't, I didn't become a Christian because somebody said, you know what, you're going to become a Christian and you get to go to church three times a week. Wow, I'm excited. I became a Christian because the guy who baptized me said, you're going to live forever. Okay. I'm into that. I want that for me. That's what I want for me. The guy who baptized me said, okay, from now on, do not feel guilty about the past. Your sins are forgiven. Oh, yeah. I want some of that. I'm excited about that. If our worship is based on these kinds of ideas, it fulfills the, 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 the definition of inspired. It is motivated by godly things. Quality number six. I need to move, right? Growing churches have holistic, small groups. Touchy subject for a lot of churches. Just let me give you the research. Researchers found that this characteristic truly separated growing from declining churches. Now, a lot of churches have small group program of one kind or another, but they don't experience any specific growth from it. And that's because small groups are just one of many programs. Holistic small groups are different. Again, I'm not pushing the idea everybody needs to have small groups. You just need to understand what a true small group program is and how it affects the church. Holistic small groups are different. These small groups are designed to help members use their gifts, share their lives, minister to each other, pray and support each other, and not just eat together. I've been part of churches that had small groups. The only thing the small groups ever did was eat together. I mean, that's all. It was like a pizza ministry, you know? You just gain weight together. No, no, nothing happened. We got together and somebody led a prayer and then somebody had said, okay, it's the time to eat. And then, this, and then they'd fill out the report, the attendance, and they'd send that into the elder as if it was like, a, I don't know, a meeting that we had to have, we had to check off. We didn't go to Sunday night church, but we did have our small group check, send in the attendance to the elders. Okay. Really? <laughs> Schwartz, and I quote him now, says... There is an enormous difference between church leaders discussing evangelism, loving relationships, or gift-oriented ministry in its staff meetings, and having Christians integrated into a small group um, and go through a process in which he or she actually experiences the meaning of these things in real terms within the confines of the group. Meaning, it's a true small group if that group edifies me. If one of my sins is I'm a secret uh, uh, consumer of pornography, if that's one of my sins, I mean, I go to church and I'm an upstanding guy. Nobody knows this, but, you know, on my downtime when I'm all by myself time, you know, I go to porn sites and I consume pornography. Nobody knows this except me. And it's killing my conscience. And all of a sudden it's starting to get a hold on me. It's starting to be a kind of addictive it's a small group if I find the guy in that group that I could take aside and say, listen, I need to talk to you about something. Oh, yeah? 
I'll meet you tomorrow for coffee. Okay. I have a problem. I need to tell you. You need to pray for me. Blah, 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 blah. Now it's a small group. Because in that small group, I have found somebody that I trust enough to share a deep and embarrassing thing with. Now I'm receiving ministry from the small group. Small groups are nothing new. The research simply points out that when these are used to mentor and minister to the saints in a very real way, it contributes to growth. They're not a bad thing. If all you do is have a small group to have a meal and fellowship together, that's fine. I'm just saying, but that all by itself will not promote the growth of the church. It'll promote individual growth, but not numerical growth is what I'm saying. It won't bring people to you. Number seven, growing churches practice quality. Did I do it again? How do you prevent small groups from becoming clicky and not allowing other people to? Well, that's in your leadership. See, the problem with small groups is when you only have two or three, you have good, strong leaders there. They're, they're very well, they're Bible, you know, well grounded in the scriptures and so on and so forth. You don't get those type of problems because one of the things that leaders have to watch out for is exactly that issue, that it just doesn't become a click. But in larger churches, sometimes you start to have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten small groups, and the quality of leadership starts to go down. And it, I would say the, the place to start is the leaders. They're the ones that ought to be looking uh, out for this type of thing. Okay? Is that good? All right. Um, quality characteristic number seven, growing churches need uh, need-oriented evangelism. Okay, again, research in this area revealed a lot of interesting facts. Not every, fact number one, not everyone had a gift or talent in the area of evangelism. Only about 10%, 10% have this natural gift. I mean, I know people like that. Don't you know people like that? They could, they could talk to a poll, you know, and get, get an answer back from a telephone poll. They can talk to anybody. They share their faith. I know a guy like that in our congregation. He's, he's amazing. He's with me, and, and I'm just minding my own business, and he's at the restaurant. He's already got a conversation going with some guy beside him about the Bible. I'm going, am I embarrassed? I'm the minister, this guy, you know? We know people like that. Another thing is, but 10%. The mistake is a lot of times the church tries to have 100% of the people have that type of skill. Not everybody does. Statistics also show that each member has about 8.5 contacts. People who are not believers who have not obeyed the gospel, who are not true. I don't know how you have 0.5 contacts, but anyways. 8.5 contacts. They found that there were two factors that promoted growth in the church due to evangelism as opposed to growth by placing membership. Here they are. The leaders knew who were the gifted in the area of evangelism, and they made sure that these people were active in this area. They equipped them. They supplied them. They, they, they enabled them to do this work. And secondly, the focus for evangelism in growing churches was not making new friends or developing new contacts with strangers, but actually concentrating on the 8.5 contacts that everybody's got. So you got what? How many adults here? 200 adults? 300 adults in this church? I know there's about 400 and some, but you know, take away the kids, the, the small children. Two, 300 adults. Imagine, everybody's got about eight contacts. <laughs> what a pool to draw from. But instead of drawing on the pool of people who are close to us naturally, we have these programs that send us out to knock on doors and to talk to strangers. You know, I'm, I'm not against that, but I'm saying let's start with you know, Jerusalem, Samaria, and then the world. Need-oriented evangelism encourages each Christian to use their gift and resources to serve non-Christians with whom they have a relationship and see to it that they hear the gospel. All right, quality characteristic number eight. All growing churches had an abundance of loving relationships. Growing churches have high love quotient. Declining churches have low love quotient. Does this seem strange to us? That the God of love would be worshipped by a church of love? Would you be willing to change the sign outside your building here that says... 
church of love meets here? Because if you did that, that'd be quite a challenge, wouldn't it? If you say Church of Christ, well, people say, oh, yeah, they're Christians. We know. We know the drill. We know what's going on. They're friendly. They serve communion. They want us to come back. You know, yeah. But if you said, if you dared say Church of Love, because you know what? I've never seen that title anywhere. Church of God. Church of... We got one church in Oklahoma City. It's a, there's a sign and it says, the true saints with an arrow that way. I said, oh, they're the true saints. They're that way. But nobody ever says the Church of Love. The research showed over and over again that a loving church is more powerful than an evangelistic church. <laughs> and more powerful than a busy church or a church that says we hold the truth. Now don't get me wrong, the church needs to be evangelistic, needs to reach out. The church absolutely needs to minister. Absolutely, the church needs to be the church of truth. We, you know, we're the church of the Bible, absolutely. <coughs> But Paul says that the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. 1 Timothy 1.5 So if a church claims to be evangelistic and busy and a pillar of the truth, but is deficient in love, then there is something missing. There's some teaching, some attitude that is incorrect because where the Spirit of Christ is, there is love. No love, no Jesus. No love, no Jesus. People come to Christ and His church because of the gospel, because of ministry, because of teaching. But I'll tell you one thing, people stay in the body because of love. You know that little gal I was talking to you about with the three kids, the little right hand kids there that she dragged those kids in here somehow on VBS night? The only way you get to keep that little girl is if you love her. Is if you love her. Because she can go to any old church around here that says, we like people, we have friends, we have this, we have a, you know. Usually the reason we don't grow is because we love the members, excuse me, we lose the members that we have gained through evangelism. And we lose them because there's a lack of love. You know, we bring them in the front door because we've evangelized them correctly, we've taught them the truth correctly, but then we don't love them. We just don't love them. Again, the research showed that in churches with a thousand people or more members, which suggests a very growing, effective church, the number one reason why people stayed even in a big church was the number of loving relationships that they had. They said, you know, I just, I don't even want to leave this church. I, I, all my friends are here. You know, my best friend is here. Conversely, the reason people usually leave, they just don't feel the love anymore. So there they are, the eight essential characteristics for growing churches, principles that can be applied to any church anywhere to promote growth. They're biblically based. They have been statistically proven through the most extensive survey ever conducted on church growth principles, empowering leadership, gift-oriented ministry, passionate spirituality, functional structures, inspiring worship, holistic small groups, need-oriented evangelism, and loving relationships. Now, most churches have some or all of these characteristics to a greater or lesser degree. The point of the research was that the growing churches had all of these characteristics to a high degree. So the invitation, Jeff didn't tell me to make an invitation or anything, but I always like to make an invitation. When I went to college, my you know, homiletics uh, professor said, you know, you can be preaching and jawing, boning and talking for 45, 50 minutes, but make sure you make a point at the end of it all. So what's the point? Well, of course, the invitation is not repent and be baptized, not what I've taught. Although that invitation is always open for those who need to respond to it, and you know who you are. No, the invitation tonight is, do you want to be a growing church? That's the invitation. For churches struggling with declining numbers, the temptation is to think that there's a, some kind of painless, quick fix to it all. Hey, we're going to hire another minister, or we're going to fire the one we've got. Or let's get a seminar, or let's add to the building, let's do something like that. Brothers and sisters, let me remind you that these type of things do not cause growth. They help manage growth already there, but they don't produce growth. 
The Bible and now research point out the way that churches can experience natural and continuous growth. And my hope, of course, for this congregation, as is for every congregation of the Lord's Church, is that we grow and we continue to grow and we continue to have impact our communities in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord.